This strain of libertarianism, I think, is a very dangerous thought. We are dangerous to the status quo of this country. Watch out, politicians. Libertarians are coming. And we're skeptical of both parties. The good old boys in the party on both sides of the aisle. I want to live in the freest possible world I can. Why does that offend people? If we put in total libertarian actions, there would be almost anarchy, mob rule. Come to Somalia, libertarian paradise. This is why people think libertarians are You're living in a world of theory. But more Americans now say... I'm a libertarian. And that's good because... You work longer to pay for government than you do for food, clothing, and housing combined. Will there be a successful libertarian political party? I'm not sure, because some say organizing libertarians is like... Herding cats. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. But more young people are saying... I own my body, I own my labor, and I own my property. When people try to control other people, really bad things happen. The rise of the libertarian. That's our show tonight. What the heck is libertarianism? I didn't know when I started reporting. I was just one more liberal. I knew there were Republicans, ick, and Democrats. That was closer to us college students. And then there were crazy people, but I had no idea there was an actual movement of thinking people who want to honor the principle of the founders, liberty, and limited government. Who knew? Took me a long time to wake up, and I'll talk about that later in the show. But the good news is that more people have woken up. A recent Gallup poll found most Americans think the government's doing too much. Good. After I woke up to the stupidity and destructiveness of big government, I stumbled across this libertarian magazine, Reason. Its motto, free minds and free markets. And this is what has taught me the most about the benefits of liberty. Its most recent editors are Nick Gillespie and Matt Welch. So, is this America's libertarian moment? Well, you know, John, I think actually we should start talking about the libertarian era because it is upon us. What, what has opened people's uh, ideas or minds up to libertarian ideas is the 21st century so far has been a demonstration project of how Republicans and conservatives can screw things up under the Bush years. And now we have the Obama version and the liberal Democrat version of screwing everything up. So people understand that trying to control more and more parts of people's lives doesn't work. They're looking for an alternative, and that's what libertarianism offers, the idea of free minds and free markets, that you can control more parts of your life. But libertarian era, I want to believe you, but I just don't see that many people get it. Well, that's a, a shorthand for libertarianism can be you're fiscally conservative and you're socially tolerant, right? Poll after poll will show you that Americans are much more fiscally conservative than their elected representatives. A majority of Americans thinks that we should ba balance the budget. Big majorities and Growing majorities, especially of young people, are more socially tolerant. They think that we should legalize marijuana, which no politician wants to talk about. They're in favor of gay marriage. Well, more these, are now coming around. They will come around last. You know, mm -hmm. the, the people lead the way in this case. And so when you have the populace, who is actually much more libertarian than the government, you will begin to see some of these expressions uh, in the political marketplace and elsewhere. Still all kinds of skepticism. Uh, libertarians are just considered odd and weird by including my colleagues. That's a nice story, right, Stossel, even for a libertarian like you? Here's how desperately wrong you are. That's what's happening, man, and you don't care. Stossel doesn't care. What's the hostility? Part of it is that we have a two-party, major two-party system in this country, and people tend to, especially in political media and elsewhere, congregate around the Republican tribe and the Democratic tribe. Um, what they are failing to recognize, and they see everything through that. So if you are against their team that's in power using libertarian arguments, you are by definition a freak, right? You're on the other side. But what they don't understand is that the world is changing around them, and people are more used to picking off issues one by one instead of accepting everything that a 
big party cramp. But let me just row. defend Bill O'Reilly for a moment, because uncharacteristically, because I don't think he has a tribe. He genuinely believes that to legalize drugs or sex work or gambling is harmful. But you know, well, this, many Americans do. One of one of the things that is interesting is when he said, "You know, you're living in theories or you're dreaming up ideas." We invaded Iraq based on a theory that turned out to be wrong, and then the idea behind that theory was we can go in there and create democracy. At, you know, just whip it up like a souffle. It didn't work. We're, we're now suffering under Obamacare and other types of financial regulations that are based on theory that have nothing to do in fact. And then when you go to the libertarian side of things, when you talk about places like Google or Apple or Whole Foods markets, where these are, these are not theories, these are not abstract concepts. These are the incarnation of the idea that people with freedom to think and to do stuff produce really interesting results. And pursuant, That's the reality. And pursuant to the, art, the idea about the drug war or people doing things for themselves and hurting themselves, the reality on the ground by almost everybody who's looked at it very closely is that the drug war, as stated, what it was trying to do has failed. I, I think Americans confuse libertarian and libertine. Sometimes. And, you know, that can be a problem because, uh, you know, the fact is, is if you believe in social tolerance, you're going to have to put up with a lot of lifestyles that you yourself might not choose. You get more peace by allowing people to go about their business as long as they're not forcing it on other people. And if that means sometimes you have to look away, well, do it. That's not so bad. Uh, there's a stereotype that paints libertarians as obsessed with marijuana and drug legalization. That led Ann Coulter to say this. You want to suck up to your little liberal friends and say, oh, but we want to legalize pot. This is why people think libertarians are We bleeped a word that means <laughs> wimps, basically. Yeah, well, I, I do want to say she is right. We are bleeps. Uh, but in her war, which is the war against liberals and Democrats, we're not useful for her at all moments, and so therefore we seem to be weak need and not part of it. What she doesn't understand is that we are freely choosing to do this, not because we're trying to suck up to anybody, but because we think it's a genuinely bad idea when the government gets in between you and your decisions, which is a conservative notion, fundamentally. The limited government notion that Ann Coulter otherwise supports in most cases is one that says the government can't solve your problems for you. It's not going to change your morality for the better. She knows that, but because she's a tribalist and because she's fundamentally intolerant. Uh, she can't brook someone else having a different approach. I welcome Ann Coulter's libertarianism when, when it's applied. I'm not part of her tribe and I'm not ever going to be. Well, she does brook it. She came on the show right. and talked. But, about you know, it's, it's also, you know, it is true that uh, I think libertarians care a lot about drug legalization because that's a very clear case of the government saying you cannot do this. You can't change your mind by ingesting this rather than that. You know, booze is okay, pot is not okay. That's a clear libertarian issue. But the fact of the matter is, is libertarians have been the people who have been sounding the alarm about government spending, the size, scope, and spending of government, and the uselessness of most government interventions into everyday life. It's not just about pot. Some say there can never be a successful libertarian party because libertarians are too independent. People claim organizing libertarians into a political party is like herding cats. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle. Holding together 10,000 half-wild short hairs, well, that's another thing altogether. That was a great Super Bowl commercial for an internet firm. Uh, they have a point, and the Libertarian Party has never done much of anything. Well, you know, that's true, and, and the fact is is that America, in its history, and sometimes it has more than two parties, but basically there's always going to be two major parties because that's the way the electoral system shakes out. What can change and what is changing is that Libertarian ideas, whether it's in the Libertarian Party or the Republican Party or even the Democratic Party, influence a lot of things, and I think we're starting to see that now. The Tea Party, to to the extent that it's been successful, it's been hammering on the very libertarian theme that the government is spending too much. Uh, and that has really changed American politics, and it will continue to because the simple math shows us that the government cannot go on spending the way that it's spending. Libertarianism has an, a, a kind of innate appeal because it trusts people to get on with their lives. You're going to make mistakes and you'll have people help you out. I disagree. Well, I think okay, government well, has an innate appeal. There's a problem. No. We need a law to solve it. No, I, I mean, well, you know, there's there's definitely that reaction. But what it is is that you know, libertarianism says, hey, give it a try, try out your life, and you know, and see where you end up. Many people seem to believe libertarians want chaos. Here's a clip from Fox Business Network. The speaker's a leader of a Tea Party group. 
you need to understand, there is a consequence to saying you're a libertarian, and if we put in total libertarian actions, there would be almost anarchy, mob rule. It's a widespread belief. There are, there is anarchism within libertarianism. I mean, Nick and I have had conversations with people who are always beating us up because we're not anarchistic enough. Uh, there's, you know, developed theories about that if you remove governments out of a lot of uh, a lot of life, human flourishing will proceed. It's an interesting philosophical theory. I don't think necessarily that is the majority of libertarians. Um, there, what we're trying to do is influence and kind of take the ship that has been lumbering along in this direction. First of all, say stop, and then can we just sort of move it this way and get it so that it's not taking so much of our life and so much of our money? At least a lot of the Tea Party people and some Republicans mm -hmm. seem to be coming around. I was happy to hear this famous politician say this. I'm listening to those independents, to those, those libertarians who are saying, you know, it is both sides of the aisle, the leadership, the good old boys in the party. Five years ago, nobody would have been talking about libertarians. No, and I, I think it's I think it's great, and I think it's a sign, you know, that the libertarian moment, that the libertarian era is upon us. And I think, uh, you know, we welcome people who talk about being libertarians because that means they're starting to engage a new set of ideas. And there's something intellectually attractive about being somewhat consistent, right? You know, Democrats and Republicans will completely switch views depending on whether they are in power. Suddenly, the Democrats love the NSA. Uh, Suddenly, Republicans hate government spending, and you know that's going to flip when they go back into power. Um, libertarians have a pretty consistent argument. They didn't love George W. Bush, and they don't love Barack Obama. A lot of libertarians say, oh, we don't want Sarah Palin. She's, she doesn't get it. There's a lot of dissent with in libertarianism. I mean, some longtime libertarians are skeptical of people like Glenn Beck. And a libertarian who will appear later on this show uh, said people like Beck we must reject their efforts and make it clear we're not on the same team. Here's Beck's response to that. I don't understand when somebody says, hey, you know what, I move in your direction. Why would you, instead of embracing them, why instead do people stand there and say, we don't want you? Well, that's going to give you 1%. There are a lot of very fussy libertarians. For so sure. Uh, <laughs> you know, when you edit Reason Magazine, yeah. you get to know them very intimately. <laughs> Whoever's going to join me issue by issue, I am happy for that issue. I don't feel like I need to create a litmus test that they need to pass. I don't need to not go to that rally because there might be non-libertarians at it, which is what a lot of people on the left were doing at the recent Anti-Patriot Act rally in Washington, D.C. They were injecting a purity test against libertarians. I think Americans understand that you go bit by bit in your life. You're a la carte everywhere, and you should be a la carte with, on politics and policy. So if Glenn Beck wants to go full libertarian, I salute you, brother. Thank you, Nick and Matt, and thank you for Reason Magazine. If you'd like to keep this conversation going, please go on Facebook or Twitter, and we can use the hashtag over here, The Rise, to let people know what you think. Coming up, some celebrities have revealed themselves to be libertarians. One of them will be here. But next, Ron Paul, maybe the biggest libertarian celebrity, will talk about how the libertarian world has changed. I could be wrong, but there do seem to be more libertarians today, more people who care about the Constitution and about limits on government power. Why has this happened? Because of me, of course. I've ranted about this on TV for 20 years, and finally it's paid off. I've convinced more people. And there are more Republicans who lean libertarian because of me. Or maybe not. In the 2008 Republican primary, there was this one obscure Republican presidential candidate who, during a debate, was asked this. Are you suggesting we invited the 9-11 attacks, sir? I'm, I'm suggesting that we listen to the people who attacked us and the reason they did it. And they are delighted that we're over there because Osama bin Laden has said, I am glad you're over on our sand because we can target you so much easier. They have already now, since that time, have killed 3,400 of our men, and I don't think it was necessary. Wendell, may I make a comment on that? That's really an extraordinary statement. It's an extraordinary statement as someone who lived through the attack of September 11 that we invited the attack because we were attacking Iraq. I don't think I've ever heard that before, and I've heard some pretty absurd explanations for September 11. Rudy Giuliani got the applause, 
But by 2012, it was Giuliani who was out of elective politics and Ron Paul getting massive crowds at rallies. So, Congressman Paul, welcome. And I think you get the credit for bringing in more, especially young people. A little in, bit. <laughs> but these are huge. You got 2,000 people showing up at rallies? To the surprise of many, including myself, our largest rally was at Berkeley campuses. We had 8,000 people came on. 8,000 yeah. people. So uh, that, that is pleasing, but it is the message because uh, people criticize me all the time. You know, Ron Paul, you're not a very good speaker, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. But the message is great. But I think what has happened is the absolute failure of our system is coming together. The failure of our foreign policy, the failure of our monetary system, the failure of our economic policy, and too much intrusion into our privacy. And people see if they just hear the message of liberty and they say, wow, that makes sense. And it's very attractive to the young people. It's very energizing for me. And when you started trying to explain these ideas to people, you were a lonely congressman you would vote no on bills. Sometimes you'd be the only no vote. And your colleagues just thought you were this weird annoyance, a pesky yeah. bug. What's he talking about? There, there, there was a lot of that. And I never expected much to happen. So these last five years have been a bit of a surprise to me. You I got used to getting no respect. <laughs> but I thought that in time, maybe in 20 or 30 years, somebody might read, well, you know, maybe let's check his voting. You were record. always optimistic. When I was doing this at CBS and then ABC and people would sneer at me, I got depressed about it. I, I never did. People ask me if I, uh, you know, got very frustrated, you know, because it didn't seem like I was getting anywhere in Washington. I said, I never got frustrated because I had low expectations. <laughs> I just didn't think I was going to change the world and change Washington. I wanted to change a few people's minds, as you have done on television for so long. But what, change people's minds if, is what's important. If, as Jefferson said, the natural progress of things is for government to grow and liberty to yield, what good is it to change a few minds? Because government keeps growing. We keep losing that freedom. We have to change the majority of minds. And then Jefferson had some advice about it. There has to be a revolution. He, he actually literally leaned toward a violent revolution, which I do not. There has to be a revolution. It has to be intellectual. It has to be nonviolent. It has to be energized. The young people have to be involved. And I think we're there. I think we're in the middle of it. And I think that what has happened... Why? Why do you think we're in the middle of it? We've got more people. Well, because right now it's actually affecting Washington. I mean, just think of this uh, recent vote uh, that didn't happen on Syria. And it was Republicans and Democrats grassroots going to their members and saying, no more war. At the same time, the leadership in the House uh, and the Senate, Republican and Democrat, they were all for it. And they're all for the Fed. So the grassroots got together. You know, I don't like this idea where we have to compromise, you know, and raise taxes and do this and that with the leadership. What we want is a coalition of people who call themselves libertarian conservatives with the progressive Democrats who are principled and they don't place the party at the top level. I'm surprised that a first term senator, your son Rand, is already getting traction and more attention. And people talk about him as a presidential candidate. Yeah, I think, I, I think it's very encouraging because, you know, I was pretty skeptical when he first announced for the Senate. You know, I thought, holy man, you know, is he skeptical. going to be He's skeptical. I didn't know whether he could, you know, make it, but it turned out much better. He's gotten more attention. His popularity has grown. Yeah, I think this is a sign of, of what's happening. There's, there's quite a few now. The one that uh, I helped get elected not, not too long ago, just the last, the last term, was Justin Amash. You know, he's leading the charge in the House and led that bill to try to rein in NSA. So there's other senators helping Rand right now. So I think, the, I think we should be able to see some very positive things happening right now. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Coming up, libertarians versus social conservatives, the schism in the Republican Party. We have extended ourselves too far around the world. We've gotten involved in these wars that are unconstitutional. They've never been declared. We don't know why we're there. We don't know when they're over. So the most important thing a new president could do is bring our troops home.
Sounds good to me. We have troops now in Korea, Japan, Italy, Germany. I thought we won that war. We're deep in debt, but we spend $700 billion on defense. It's too much. But I'm told I'm clueless when I say things like that. Told that by some very smart neoconservatives, the Wall Street Journal editorial page, and one of my favorite magazines, the Weekly Standard. Its executive editor is Fred Barnes. I'm clueless. Well, maybe naive. And certainly uh, 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 Ron Paul is uh, 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 deluded about the importance of the American military presence around the world. It underwrites global security, the global economy. Without the American military presence around the world, you wouldn't have open sea lanes. You would, uh, uh, international trade would be very constricted. But Japan could police its sea lanes. Other countries could participate. Everybody's freeloading off of us and we can't afford it. To a set, in a sense, they are freeloading off, uh, freeloading off of us, but it's worth every penny of it because it, it helps the United States. It's to the benefit of the United States to have this global economy. And that's why bringing the boys home <laughs> and, you know, Ron Paul means all of them. His son is, is quite different, Senator Rand Paul, but he wants all of them to shut down all the bases, bring every troop home. Uh, that would be a uh, gigantic mistake. We could mistake. debate that, but I would argue the global economy would do just fine if we didn't have 60,000 soldiers in Germany. And well, we did have 300,000 there, and that was crucial to have them there. Look, it protected, that was that. It protected Western Europe for 50 years. Well, that was them. The troops are in Korea now, and, and, and that's now, uh, are, are, are preventing a war and attack by North Korea on South Korea. South Korea's economy is 45 times bigger than North Korea's. It could defend itself. Uh, well, it, it, uh, I'm not sure, because the, almost the entire economy of North Korea uh, goes to the military. Look, preserving the peace around the world, deterring war, is something is a responsibility that America has taken on, I think, for good reason, and it's done by our military presence around the world. Don't we make new enemies by having soldiers in all these places? Look, you go around the world, John, and people may say, oh, they, they criticize the United States, but you know what? At the end of the day, they want to be protected by the American military umbrella. Australia does, other Asian countries do, uh, the European countries do. Uh, nothing good happens internationally in the world without the United States leading the way. And, and one of the ways the United States leads the way is with its American military presence. They sure made a lot of enemies in Afghanistan. We armed the wrong side. Uh, we've gone to Iraq twice. This is winning? This is a good thing? Well, I wouldn't say winning, but uh, it's uh, better than the alternative. Uh, it didn't backfire when we armed the Muhadeen? We didn't help create Osama bin Laden? I don't think so. Let's move on to another conflict between libertarians and defense hawks uh, after Congressman Justin Amash attacked the NSA spying. Mm -hmm. Chris Christie said this. This strain of libertarianism that's going through both parties right. right now, I think is a very dangerous thought. And when Rand Paul led a filibuster on the president's drone policy, Senator John McCain called him and his supporters wacko birds. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're wacko birds? Well, Rand Paul, Senator Rand Paul, is certainly not a wacko bird. He says Congress has basically abdicated its role in foreign policy. Uh, and I think he's made a good point on that. All right, well, let's, let's move on to the title of this show, The Rise of the Libertarians. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're skeptical. Well, I'd call it a blip, <laughs> not, not that much of a rise. John, as, as you said earlier in the show, the Libertarian Party, for instance, is... Uh, has never done anything. So far, but it's about to. <laughs> it's been around a long time. You have said, without embracing social issues, abortion, drugs, gay marriage, conservative philosophy can never become a majority. You still believe that? No, what I, what I think I said was that that group is essential to the Republican Party. And I hear lots of people say, oh, they're terrible, they're scaring people away, we can't win with them. Well, you certainly can't win without them. So the way for Republicans to win is to be anti-abortion, anti-gay marriage, anti-drugs. The way for, for Republicans to win is to welcome this wing of the party, and it's a heck of a lot bigger one than the, than the uh, libertarian wing, hate to tell you, John, uh, to welcome in the, in the party and not uh, drive them out. Chris Christie's doing pretty well. He gave in on same-sex marriage. Well, he's opposed, to, he's opposed to same-sex marriage. He just didn't uh, pursue a court appeal. Uh, and he's basically a pro-lifer. Okay, we won't agree on that. Um, your magazine did this parody of Ron Paul. Yeah. Uh, what's the point? 
he's the lovable Craig. You know, he's, uh, look, it's a parody. We parody everybody. Uh, and I'm sure Ron Paul has a sense of humor. Perhaps other libertarians don't. I see. At least you're not frowning, John. He's the guy that voted against the, giving a congressional medal to Mother Teresa because it costs too much. You know, he does these things that are odd, and, uh, and, and we were doing a parody about it. the role of Congress to give medals to Mother Teresa. Look, I, I'll bet you if, if uh, uh, Ron Paul saw that, uh, uh, that parody, he'd have gotten a great chuckle. Thank you, Fred Barnes. Coming up, how I saw the light and, unlike him, became a libertarian and also a libertarian celebrity. Are you Republicans? No! Are you Democrats? No! You are students for? Liberty! That was at a gathering of a group of mostly college students that calls itself Students for Liberty. They're very clear about not calling themselves Democrats or Republicans. And that big group did not exist just a few years ago. It was started by Alexander McCobin. He's joined here by two students who run Liberty chapters at their colleges. Barbara Sostaya and Matthew Lacourt. So why'd you create this? So I realized I was a libertarian from a very young age, John. My father gave me a copy of Atlas Shrugged for my birthday in ninth grade. And I spent as much time as I could throughout high school reading as much as I could on libertarianism and objectivism. So you were weird in high school. <laughs> yeah, and when I got to college, I realized I was still weird. I didn't meet a single other person who thought the same way as me for the first two years and nearly became a socialist just because it would be easier. But instead what, of- What actually, college were you in? The University of Pennsylvania. I decided to create a student organization, the Penn Libertarians, just to see if there were others out there. And within a year, we had over 200 members on our list serve. Students, even professors, came out of the woodwork, and I realized there had always been libertarians on my campus. We just had no way of identifying one another until there was a student group that could bring us together. And you had a, your first conference at Columbia. You hoped for 30 people. You got about 100. Next year, 153, 300, 500, 1,000, more than 1,000. Growing very fast. I mean, <laughs> compare it to the National Convention of the Young Democrats and the College Republicans, you get more students now. I truly think this is the libertarian generation. Young people today have grown up extremely socially tolerant, but also skeptical of government intervention into the economy. Come on, at your schools, the majority are not libertarian, right? Well, I think that the majority do have libertarian leanings, and they're just not very aware of what it means to be a libertarian. I think what we are seeing is that young people are very interested in the ideas of liberty. However, they think that there is Republicans and there's Democrats. And so when we present them with this idea, this new philosophy of libertarianism, they're very open to it, they're very interested. It's something that really hits a core of young people, that we're, we're not uh, interested in having government tell us how to live our lives, and we don't want government's hand in our pockets telling us how to spend our money. And I think that when you put those two things together, you talk about the ideas of libertarianism, young people respond, and young people, as we see with Students for Liberty, are really getting involved in this message. And where did you get this? Are your parents libertarian? No, I just always was hesitant to believe in, in high school, in my history classes, that the government had the answer to everything. <laughs> and then I, I found myself at a Students for Liberty conference in high school, um, and everything changed change that day. I got to Hofstra University in Long Island, New York. I started my own campus group, and now we're the largest political group on campus. Where'd you get it? I am an immigrant from Argentina, and I've always had ideas about bettering the condition of immigrants in America and improving the lives for all people. I just didn't know what the best way to do that was until I attended a Students for Liberty conference. And then I started doing some reading, some research, watching Students for Liberty's webinars, and doing everything I could to become informed. And then I came to the realization that there is no better way to achieve the ends of prosperity for all people than libertarianism. Which country has worse, more oppressive government, Argentina or the United States? Argentina. <laughs> You're going overseas now with this group. You've had conferences where? We're running 10 conferences around Europe this fall. We just ran our first conference in Chile a couple of weeks ago for 100 attendees. We ran a conference in Venezuela at the beginning of this year for 80 attendees. 
I was even in Nigeria a few months ago for the first African Students for Liberty Conference that had over 350 attendees while the teachers were on strike. Universities were shut down. Students traveled across the country to be able to make it. In fact, Where, how do they f get the concept? Liberty is a universal concept that people intuitively grasp. Well, Americans don't. I think a lot of Americans do, and especially the young people in America. The other great thing is that with the advent of the internet, people have access to more information, more ways of communicating and connecting with each other in ways that we never could have before. Students for Liberty wouldn't be around without the internet and probably Facebook. And Barbie, you say that at your college, the students are quite receptive, professors, not so much. Right, professors, it's a different case. So I have a lot of professors who tell me that liberty, in the way I see it, isn't very applicable around the world or to our foreign policy, or that if my ideas and our ideas were implemented, then the world would be chaotic. I think what we're seeing right now is, is almost like the perfect storm for libertarianism. People our age have grown up in, in a time where we have consistent war, we have widespread government surveillance, we have international crisis, and we have historically low approval ratings for institutions of government. And we contrast that with the fact that we're all on our iPhones, we're all on our laptops, we have this free market innovation versus old, archaic government. And young people are just saying, no, I'm choosing the market, I am choosing entrepreneurs and innovators, and not the government, and this is how we're going to solve the solutions of today, and it leads to more, more prosperous and a more free society. Well, I hope you're right, and I hope you never outgrow this. Thank you. Uh, Matthew, Barbie, Alexander, coming up, some celebrities have come out of the libertarian closet. Vince Vaughn, Drew Carey, Kurt Russell, Tom Selleck, and this famous magician. I think libertarianism is the right to be stupid. If you live in a free country, you have the right to put anything you want into your own body. Anything else is bull****. That was Penn Jillette in a clip from his TV show that debunked nonsense like astrology, psychic, so-called natural foods. But what got my attention was that this famous magician was taking a stance on libertarian issues like the war on drugs, laws against prostitution, just the size of government. Penn and his partner Teller, though it's harder to tell with Teller because he doesn't speak, were clearly libertarians, so yippee, that's rare in the entertainment business. So, Penn, what brought you around? I was brought around to libertarianism by just good old-fashioned argument. My, uh, my friend, uh, Tim Jennison, he just kept saying, shut up, you're wrong. You're just wrong. That convinced you're wrong. you? Absolutely, because it was done with complete respect. You know, I would say something, he would make a counter argument, and it was compelling. And when I would say something I couldn't really back up, he just, and after about four hours, he got me so that I was thinking. And then I had to go do a lot of reading. You know, before you do a big change like that, you got to go through that reading phase. What did you read? Um, a lot of stuff that he, uh, he recommended, you know, uh, the Road to Serfdom and some Ayn Rand and uh, all that stuff you'd expect to read. And then I got to, very shortly after that, met Harry Brown, you know. Who and, ran for president of the Libertarian A couple ticket. years, and was a wonderful man. Wonderful, wonderful man. And what grabbed me about libertarianism, I am very much against force. I have never hit anybody in anger in my life. I am a complete pacifist. And the idea, I remember when, um, when they had the, uh, uh, the Ohio Museum uh, with the, uh, I'm trying to find a way to say this, with, with, the, with, the, with the crucifix in the urine, that, that art piece, which I thought was great. Um, my mom and dad didn't like that. My mom and dad were Christians. And that being paid for by their tax money really, really bothered me. And it put me in that awkward position. Well, people don't get the, the um, connection how that is force. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, uh, try not paying your taxes, and they'll eventually be forced. So my feeling is we need taxes for certain things. We need defense. We need courts. I think the idea of a private police force is very, very frightening. We don't want to do that. But I will work so hard to help you build a library. But building a library at gunpoint, saying that we need this so badly, we're going to put a gun on you, it, it, that is the the basis of libertarianism to me and is not using force. Also, charity is a great feeling. 
And when it's done by force, all the joy goes away. Many people think if it's a good idea, the government should do it. Uh, the real answer is, is if it's a good idea, the government shouldn't do it. If it's a good idea, we can do it without the free government. people will voluntarily <laughs> yeah. do it. And I also, you know, it puts me in opposition. I mean, I've, I've never had a sip of alcohol or any drug in my life. And I was on the cover of High Times magazine because I'm very much in favor of drug legalization. I believe we need to have those freedoms, but uh, I don't want to use them myself. And uh, that's another hard thing to get across about libertarianism, is most of the freedoms that I argue for, I have no desire to use for myself, but I want other people to be able to do that, even when it's stupid. I think libertarianism is the right to be stupid. <laughs> On this show, I often try to point out that government doesn't work. A libertarian, free markets do. But you told the Daily Caller, I have no evidence that libertarianism leads to a better life. I just think it's morally right. Libertarians consider freedom to be an end in and of itself, which I thought was just a fascinating idea. It really is true. And I why? Think, Sell that. Why I is think it? If, if what about there's poverty, there's ending wars, there's yes, all that is good. qualities, all but good. But I, I just think that, uh, that freedom itself, the idea that each individual can do what they want, the most individual power possible without hurting other people, is an end in itself. And I also, I just don't want to use force. That's the whole thing. You know, I'll, I'll argue with you about maybe, uh, maybe you shouldn't be doing heroin, but I don't want the government to come in and do, use force for that. The charity you advocate is disproportionately supported in America by religious people, and yet your book is just out in paperback. Every day is an atheist holiday. Mm -hmm. So what's the libertarian atheist connection? I am a very strong atheist. I'm a very strong libertarian, but I know and respect uh, Christian libertarians, and I know and respect atheist liberals. Uh, those don't necessarily go together. In my mind, they go together in that there's an incredible respect for self-reliance. So what do you say to the people, though? Government's too big. You want to just let the poor suffer? Don't we need a net? I do, government I do think we need a net. I don't know if you need the word government in there. There was a question I was asked, um, what, one in five people in this country is poor. What does that mean to you? And I said, that means there's four people that can help them. <laughs> there's four of us that can help each individual. Ken Gillette, thank you. <laughs> Coming up, my take on the rise of the libertarian. Woohoo! That's a good thing. God. <laughs> You see these Emmys? Aren't they impressive? These are just a few of the 19 Emmys I won when I was one more liberal consumer reporter. John Stossel, consumer editor, Channel 2 News. I criticized business, called for government regulation to protect you from deceitful ads like this one. The world's smallest air conditioner. We tried it out in the smallest room we could find, a telephone booth. We ran the air conditioner for half an hour and watched the thermometer. It went up two degrees. What a ripoff! There ought to be a law, a rule, a government regulator to stop scams like that. And sometimes politicians pass laws because of my reporting. One state created a Department of Consumer Affairs after my exposés. And I won more Emmys. I was so proud. But then, I stayed on the consumer affairs beat. I watched regulators work. I watched politicians brag about laws like OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Law. They showed this chart revealing how workplace deaths dropped steadily since OSHA began. Thank goodness for government regulation. Except when we took the time to check out workplace deaths from the years before OSHA, surprise, the slope of the line was about the same. Things were getting better before government. When people are free, things get better without endless rules. As we get richer, people care more about safety. Factories learn from previous accidents, and so on. Government's like someone who jumps in front of a parade and pretends he led the parade. Free markets save more lives than government ever will. Government regulation fails and fails again. It makes everything cost more, adds red tape and legal work. But it doesn't stop the scams. There'll always be some. Despite all the new rules, crooks still push the work-at-home scams. 
you have won a prize scams? I reported on those 40 years ago. Regulators said, we'll fix that. But they didn't. And then I left local television to join Good Morning America. And I discovered there aren't that many really big national scams. I'd found plenty of nasty things going on in Portland, Oregon, and here in New York City. But once I was on a national stage, I found few large-scale scams because of the free market. The local cheaters didn't grow. The companies that got big and rich were the ones that served their customers pretty well. Market competition policed businesses, rewarded good ones, punished bad ones. Competition protects consumers better than government. So I really should put these Emmys in the garbage. I got these because economically ignorant people give out these awards. They love regulation and big government. I should be ashamed of these. Fortunately, I read more economics. I discovered Reason Magazine. I became a libertarian. Suddenly, I saw the wonderful things that happen when government leaves us alone. Now, I should also say that libertarians don't claim that all consumer reporting is bad. It's the call for regulation that's bad. Consumer reporting itself actually helps the market work. It gives people information. So maybe I should keep some of these things. Anyway, most of you are smarter than me. You figured it out without having to do years of consumer reporting. It took me too long to understand that life is best when government backs off and allows people to do anything that's peaceful. That's our show. See you next week.